welcome friends, uh, Facebook friends, Zoom friends, audience. Um, I'm, uh, it, we're alive. <laughs> so oh, we're welcome live. to this evening. <laughs> So welcome to this evening, um, tonight's Fangoria Convo Fango. Uh, we'll be hosting Black Horror Noir. Uh, Black Horror Today and Tomorrow, which is a really cool title. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that, that, it just sounds great. And the topics that um, we're gonna talk about, uh, first of all, is the horror noir documentary, just a little bit of that. Well, I could talk about that forever because there's so much interesting things that was in that documentary. Um, and we'll get to that as also, I wanted to talk a little bit about what common black tropes, which I think is, um, they're used, they're overused, and sometimes they're successfully used. You see them all, you, know, you see them a lot, um, even though they bring a negative or a positive, depends on how you view them. Um, but they're still being used. And why are they still being used? <laughs> um, also, um, gender. I want to go into the gender of actors and the stereotypes, male and female. Um, how do they apply? And the future of Black horror. Um, where are we, you know, where are we going with it? Is it changing? Um, where do we hope it will lead us to? And also the elephant in the room, the upcoming Black anthology. I know we can't talk probably not anything about it, but I do have some interesting um, questions about it. Like what do we hope to see in this anthology or not see? I don't know. I don't know how far you guys go. <laughs> um, but who we have here today is three lovely ladies, very talented ladies. Um, they're, they're extraordinary in their own gifts. Um, thank you, you guys, for coming this evening. We have Tanan Anari. <laughs> yes! Do, she's a writer, educator, and producer, award-winning um, uh, who author who teaches Black horror and Afrofuturism at UCLA. Um, that, that's so cool. <laughs> uh, also an avid book writer. She wrote so many books um, on Black horror. Um, also won many awards. One of them is the NAACP Image Award. That is so awesome. Also executive producer of Shudder Horror Noir, A History of Black Horror. That is currently streaming on Shudder. You guys have to watch it. If you have not seen it, it is worth every second of it. It is fabulous. Um, also, one of the executive producers for the upcoming um, Black Horror Anthology that was just announced by Shudder and AMC. So, welcome. <laughs> Next we have is Ashley Blackwell, um, a writer, producer herself, uh, film studies professor at St. Joseph University. Um, also creator writer of Graveyard Shift Sisters, which I you know, happen to be honored in there at one point in my life, a couple of years ago. I even have it here. It's very special. <laughs> um, also uh, producer of the Shutter documentary, Horror Noir, one of the producers for that as well. And also one of the producers of the upcoming mythology. And then we have Anya Stanley, um, who's also a writer and I did read some of your stuff and let me, I, I was laughing. I mean, the way you write, <laughs> it's like in your face to the point. Um, her, she specializes in horror um, analysis, focusing on gender perspectives. Um, she wrote for Room Work, Shudder, uh, Dread Central and Crypt Marquee and so many others. I just didn't have any more room on the paper <laughs> to write. Wherever they'll hire me. Um, also currently running a monthly column at Fangoria um, called Rated XXYX. I hope I'm saying it exactly how it's <laughs> saying, but it's currently on there and it's a gendered viewpoint and numerous, she's been a guest on numerous podcasts. This woman has been everywhere. So <laughs> welcome ladies, welcome. Um, also, if the audience, if you have questions, please put them on Facebook If you know, I could see them um, and I will answer, um, ask the, the lovely ladies here if possible. And um, make sure if you, if you have questions, just click on the Q&A icon there. And 
<laughs> Let's get started. So how are you guys doing? How is everything and Black horror? I mean, it's everywhere. Now it's everywhere. I mean, I haven't heard much about it. Um, growing up, I didn't hear anything. And I took in film school and there really wasn't that much. And that was probably 10 years ago, something like that. So I didn't hear a lot of it. Um, very, very touched, but everything out, you know, we got a, everything else but that. Even in school, um, I remember in um, school watching some things, but um, not very much. So um, why, why Black horror? Like why focus on that? What, what significance has it, should be known for everybody in the film industry? Well, anyway. should I jump in? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> anyone been, can jump in. And if you guys hear any question or you just jump right on in. I've been bouncing up and down just thinking about this panel <laughs> because black horror is my favorite subject. It's my favorite thing to talk about. Uh, I've been publishing it since 1995. Get Out blew me away in 2017 and basically uplifted everybody, you know, opened so many doors, uh, even directors who had preceded Jordan Peele, like Rusty Cundiff with Tales from the Hood, got new life after Get Out with uh, sequels he'd been trying to get made for years. So, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of ways I could answer this question. Black horror is popping right now. Um, I've never had as much interest in my books and short stories as right now. I've never uh, been working on so many film and television projects as I am right now. I, and I'm even been in a position to help other writers get jobs and get paid, which is the real litmus test. <laughs> you can always <laughs> squeeze one person through the door, but can you bring anybody with you? And, and at this, at least in this moment in history, I'm able to help bring other people along too. So I am just ecstatic. And, and in terms of why Black Horror, uh, I'll just say really briefly, I don't think that it's that, that horror fans in general are more woke than the average population, but I do think that the non-Black horror community has been super, super supportive of films like Get Out, films like Horror Noir, and is as excited, and it seems, as I am about the upcoming uh, Black anthology series, because I think horror fans love novelty. And it's new and it's fresh and it's a different perspective. Uh, thematics are slightly different. The monsters are gonna look slightly different and horror fans are just tired of seeing the same thing over and over again, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, Anya, Ash. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to build on uh, to Nana Reeves' statement there, it's, it's you know, you, you can throw a stone and hit five horror remakes and, <laughs> and you know, 20 uh, reimaginings, but if you're doing that within the prism of the black experience, of the Native American experience, of the Muslim experience, all of these things become fresh and um, it feels like something new to us um, because we're getting a look at someone else's experience and how horrifying it can be on a daily basis um, and on a systemic basis and on a generational basis. And so these are things that we all need um, in order to gain a sense of empathy. I, I remember when I saw Get Out, uh, the first time I saw it in the theater, I saw it three times, but the first time I saw it, uh, oh, that sounds really like, I would have seen it a fourth time. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, anyway, it's, out there. it's in the streets okay. now, it's out there. Um, but I remember when I saw it, there was the moment, that climactic moment where those, those, those flashing lights flashed and you know, homegirl sitting out there on the road and she does that little smirk, like, you know, what's mm -hmm. about to happen now, right? Like, like she did that. The flashing lights happen and everybody in the theater, even the old couple, the old white couple sitting in front of me went, oh no, because we <laughs> all knew, despite, you know, whatever our opinions are, everybody knew what those flashing lights meant to the protagonist of the movie. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that was something that no Twitter thread, no talking head on CNN could convey to, to people better than Jordan Peele could have in that moment with that scene. And that's what the, the power of the medium does. And so that's why Black horror, that's why Native horror, that's why all of the, all these different uh, prisms to um, put through that spectrum, to, to put through that genre. Mm -hmm. Ashley? Yeah, I 
guess I always kind of knew that if you had more people of color involved in the genre, creators, like being able to have the opportunity to create their work, I knew they were going to have fresh perspectives on um, different aspects of what, what of what we love about the genre and just kind of remix it and make it their own. I'm always subconsciously knew that I, can't, I became more aware of it around 2013 when I did start the website, Oh Great Russia Sisters. So um, similar for me, like I studied horror in college, but I never really even thought or conceived of the idea of um, this kind of like a uh, like black horror kind of as a subgenre because it wasn't something that people were talking about. And so, and then one of the reasons, and I've said this before, but kind of the genesis of the Graveyard Shift Sisters is because um, Dr. Coleman's book had been out since I think it was published in 2011 and no one was talking about it. And that really annoyed <laughs> me. Um, it really, it not even annoyed, if I'm being honest, it made me angry. Um, and also there was another scholar who was doing her master's thesis on 70s horror cinema and making multimedia projects surrounding it. And so I'm just like, no one's talking about this. And so um, I just, I guess that's why Black Horror, because it was so overlooked. And I'm just like, well, if no one else is going to talk about it, I will. Um, and I think more and more people just kind of started um, following even more after, but it really for me, like if it wasn't for Christina Leith Mallon and Dr. Robin Meese Coleman, I wouldn't be here. Um, Cause they're really, to me, they're the pioneer, they're like the really, they're the foundation. They're the pioneers of like, kind of like jumpstarting this and kind of saying, well, I think this is important scholarship and no one else is doing it. So, and again, I just kind of followed their lead essentially. Oh, okay. Um, when creating um, for Ashley and, Town on Reef. <laughs> when creating this, um, there were so many films in there. There, like I've never even heard of um, that you guys really focused on making that film. Was it hard? Like some films you couldn't put in that were important. Like how did you choose what goes in and what you had to leave out when doing Har Noir? I think that would be so difficult. <laughs> Ashley, you need to speak to that. I mean, really, yeah. there could have been three or four documentaries from Dr. Coleman's book, you know, means Coleman's book. Right. So as far as like choosing which ones to focus on or the images that you kind of see throughout the film. Both, if you because, can. Because <laughs> uh, it was just like how, because I, as I was watching, I feel like there, there should be a part two, part three, part four, because there's, there's still films out there. There's still stories out there. How did you guys choose for this specific like this is important to talk now, to bring up now. So the content that we use, right? Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, including our editor, it was inclu included, like our editor and, inc and inc then including me and then plus two other, the, two other of the producers that we were kind of a team and we were kind of honestly just kind of going off of the dome <laughs> of what to choose. Honestly, like we designed a script for it. And so we had the story and then it was just kind of, we just kind of worked on kind of putting it together. And I really had to like, never have I ever rose to a challenge where I had to think off the top of my head, what would this, these interview clips, how would this go, how, what, what scene or what movie would go perfectly with this? And then I'm glad I had the help for it because, but I know it felt like kind of a mammoth challenge, but at the same time, it was, it was honestly a, not easy, but it wasn't like impossible. Like I it was able to kind of come up with things again. And it, like, again, brainstorming and collaboration um, was fantastic. I, honestly, editing was my favorite part of the process. Um, there's no, honestly, I, if anyone's thinking there was, a, there was a magic or science to it, it really wasn't. It was just like using the knowledge that I already knew to kind of incorporate things. And then having another producer kind of come in and bring in his insight and kind of finesse it. And I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense too. I'm glad he, he, he thought of that as well. And so, and then also the other producer kind of saying, what do you think would be, like just giving me ideas of what would be good here and then kind of thinking of things. Oh, wow. <laughs> That sounds like a one that a lot of process into making that film. Um, we actually have a question here from Kendall. Um, they said, I wonder if the horror genre is somehow uniquely focused on aspects of identity and in a way intersectionally, like how, how does it, you know, somewhat focus on the identity of black horror? You know, um, that's an interesting question, Kendall. Um, <laughs> I, I think that a lot of the horror we're seeing now 
is vote is focused on uh, being intersectional you know because of the rise of black horror and i don't think a lot of people realize this i mean we we see that jordan peele opened doors in terms of black horror especially specifically for horror noir which got the green light the day after jordan peele won his oscar so there, there are no accidents <laughs> right but i've talked to queer horror creators um i just saw an indigenous horror film uh i think it's still on shutter uh blood quantum that's you know from an indigenous point of view um his house is about an african immigrant experience which is great on netflix and and i think what's happening as a result of sort of the raised awareness that oh there are other horror creators out there who haven't had their voices and stories told and that same thing that anya was talking about is creating an opportunity for for us to learn about each other, to learn about other marginalized communities. And there's something about trauma, you know, like in Halloween, the, the last reboot of Halloween, re revisiting uh, Jamie Lee Curtis's character as she's struggling with PTSD and she's become the super survivor preparer is also helping us process our trauma, right? As, as people who've been through whatever we, we've been through and whether it's racial trauma, trauma related to gender, I mean, the trauma and horror go so well together. Shudder has a film now called The Dark and the Wicked, which is a very, very grim film, especially if you've ever been a caretaker. And part of the horror is that everything that's horrible in that movie and scary in that movie is what it feels like when a loved one is dying. So it's that trauma of loss. And, and because we're having these universal experiences, coming through the marginalized lens, it does give all of us a chance to learn not just about what makes us different, but what makes us all alike. Ooh. Wow, okay. Um, did you did you guys want to jump in on that? Uh, yeah. Or your yeah, opinion? I, I think a lot of the time, uh, especially when it comes to black horror, um, identity has historically been placed upon the black community by white filmmakers by white storytellers and by um shoot in the case of the birth of a nation uh white presidents you know like it, it's something where where they decide what you are who you are and they will disseminate that and it will be accepted widely and so um horror is also a great medium for uh black storytellers to explore that themselves and be able to disseminate that and and show that to a black audience who can see it, absorb it, reflect on it and, and say, yes, I can make my own identity and I, I can assert that, um, screw what the white people say. <laughs> Ashley? No. <laughs> I think they covered it. <laughs> okay, uh, next I wanted to talk about the common um, tropes out there. Um, just recently, I watched um, Scare Package that's on Shudder. And they that movie used every trope you could think of. The whole movie was one big trope. And then there was one where, you know, they had the black guy that was in there. So they were trying to escape out the room. And as they were leaving, um, the woman behind him was, you know, about to start walking behind him. And one guy stopped him and said, no, oh, stopped her and said, no, 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 don't go behind him. And she was like, why? So as she, as he stepped out, an ax just flew and killed him. Like right there, he was like the first one gone. Um, so that, that, that brings me to this. Now we know what the meaning of tropes, we know how they make, um, you know, characters in black horror look. Why are they still being used? And, and some like successfully, they, they made them funny or it's, it's just common. Why not haven't that changed or they stopped? Anybody have any like idea of that? I don't know. I just find it that it, it helps the stories along for some reason, I don't know, but I just think it's interesting that these tropes still going, even though they make us look a certain way. I think with some storytellers, it's cheap, it's easy and there's precedent for it. Um, right to the and <laughs> uh, which is why we still see some of these tropes like with uh, like with Annabelle and the the sacrificial Negro and stuff like that like some of that stuff is still going on today but 
if you take those tropes and put them within a black storyteller's lens, I'm thinking of Eve's Bayou here, where you talk about the magical Negro, um, that that trope is not a trope when when it's used by by um, the storytellers involved with that movie because they talk about not the magical Negro but uh, a folk religion and voodoo that's not really voodoo in the case of one character in the movie. Um, so, so these things can be done right if told by the right storyteller. Yeah, let's, let's leave it at that. Let's try that. <laughs> <laughs> I can agree. Ashley, do you want to jump in? No, I think I don't have anything to add. I, I, what, I, what I do love about Eve's Bayou is that you also have kind of, with, with, that, with, that, folk, with that folk religion, you also have different ways of, you, you see how different women practice it. And you kind of see how it's used for healing. It's not used for evil or um, mal um, intent all all the time. They, I, what's shown is kind of it's you have these kind of multiple sides of it. You're you're seeing different perspectives of kind of a similar um, religious tradition in a sense. And that's what may, I think that's what really makes that um, aspect of East Bayou really rich. And there is there's like there's a conjure woman who is kind of shown as monstrous, but they're very careful to show that it's through the eyes of a child who's seeing this conjure yeah. woman. And so that's, that's an important distinction that I'm not sure other filmmakers would make. <laughs> yeah, the, the nuance is important. And I think the tropes existed because we didn't have black creators who were getting their movies made, you know? <laughs> uh, one of the things that we couldn't talk about in the documentary Horror Noir is a distinction uh, Dr. Robin Armin's Coleman makes between black horror and Blacks in horror, and a lot of Black people who appeared in horror, you know, up until way too recently, were only there because white creators specifically sometimes set out to cast Black people in those roles, and that meant that in their heads very often they were already fulfilling a trope, right? <laughs> it's like to be a magical Negro, a spiritual guide, the first to die, these are, these are you know, the sacrificial Negro, um, very comforting uh, images, uh, I think, that are embedded in our history, as I said in Horror Noir, <laughs> that faithful servant. It's such a comforting image that a Black person would be willing to lay down their life for you, so you must not be so bad, right? <laughs> uh, and and it's, it's a very, I think it's really a function of not having a life where these creators knew a lot of Black people, frankly. Uh, I'm from Miami, and I like to tell the story that I was always confused in Miami about why so many movies were casting Latino actors as gardeners, because that mm -hmm. was not a thing in Miami. In Miami, the stereotype is your boss, okay? <laughs> the stereotype <laughs> is your coworker. We, there were, we don't have the same stereotype. Uh, so that was because for a lot of Hollywood screenwriters, the only Mexican people they knew or Latino people they knew were their um, household help, right? So they would appear in these movies in a way that I always found just baffling because that wasn't my experience at all. And I think you can sort of extrapolate that out to the sassy friend. Mm. Um, all those stereotypes are someone's best approximation of what blackness looks like and feels like or the purpose mm -hmm. it should be serving in the story. And I don't want to get too carried away, but woo. Okay. <laughs> one of the things that we have to look out for in the future of black horror is that because studios and executives have discovered that there's money to be made, in the casting of black actors, uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're seeing some problematic scripts emerge. Uh, that I, I, you know, I'm trying to work in this business, so I'm not <laughs> trying to yeah. name names. <laughs> mm -hmm. I got you, I got but you. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a thing, it's a thing. Yeah. So the same studio that won't accept a script from a black screenwriter, it doesn't, it's not quite what they're looking for, <laughs> will greenlight a script from a white screenwriter, cast it with a black lead, and then have a problem riddled script that sometimes they have to hire people to fix. Mm. Okay, I do have a question here from Chris. Um, he says, what do you suggest a white screenwriter can do to continue their work and add diversity to their characters and storytelling without overstepping and telling stories that would be better served coming from black creator voices? Just make the character a human being and don't worry about race. Just 
hire an eclectic group of people and that person is just a character with multi with just that you humanize that character that character has multi, has different emotions going on has an arc you know mm-hmm. um and then just 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 give people jobs who need them who are strong actors and diversify that like make it look like the world that we live in okay yeah um an issue you'll see if you look at a lot of classic television i knew an actor who was on a an ensemble show and he was the only black person in the cast. And he was the only person in the cast who didn't have a personal life. <laughs> you know, you never saw where he was at home. He never had a girlfriend. And he asked the writers about it. And they said, well, I don't know what it's like to be inside a black person's apartment. And to Ashley's point, uh, it's like being in anybody's apartment to a degree, right? You can extrapolate out some of just the basic human stuff. And I think it's also a good idea to get sensitivity readers if you're concerned about it. I've use sensitivity readers when I was writing characters who were different, you know, Um, and there's also a course called Writing the Other that I will recommend. If you look it up on the internet, um, uh, Writing the Other, which is specifically designed for writers uh, like you who want to be inclusive in your work, but want to take it to the next level in terms of characterization so that there's even more authenticity beyond our humanity. Okay. Anya? I was just writing down the uh, writing the other course in my phone there, <laughs> just to make note of it. Um, you know, I've never sold a script, so I'm gonna I'm gonna speak as a, as a critic. I have the easy job of being the film critic who gets to okay. see your work after it's all finished. Um, I think that uh, as as Tanana Reef said that the, the the diversity hires are uh, diversity hires diversity writers uh, diversity readers. <laughs> <laughs> is, um, is a good idea because um, when you write a black character, um, what I've seen is is white writers writing a black character and then not exploring the full implications of having a black character and what that means for the power dynamics involved. Um, actually, I'm thinking of a non horror movie here, and that's the movie Soul, the Pixar movie Soul, um, and the implications of putting um, a a white character into a black body. Mm -hmm. and how that plays out. And there was a lot of pushback and a lot of resistance uh, about that, a lot of static on social media after the movie came out, even though they had diversity readers and and, and, um, people to kind of look out for that kind of thing because it's it's a bad look to put a white person in a black body and not allow a black person to control their own person, their their own personhood for an entire movie. Um, So it's, it's a good idea to if you're going to do that, if you're not just going to let a Black storyteller tell that story and speak to that experience, then do the work and, and explore the full implications of putting a Black character in, in that space and, and what they do, what what happens to them, and what agency they have. Okay. Yeah. Ashley, do you have any words? I said what I said earlier. Oh, oh, oh sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, I have, a, <laughs> I have a, uh, one more question here um, from an anonymous person. It says, some Black critics accuse Black directors of watering down their stories, endings, and messages in order to attract White audiences. What do you guys think about that? Yes. Uh, not the one <laughs> I'm going to mute myself for this one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, I think... <laughs> Uh, how do I answer this? Um, let's just put it this way. Until the day before yesterday, in terms of how time feels, the only people you could sell your scripts to were going to be white executives, right? And they were selling it up the chain to their bosses who were also white. And there's a certain kind of story you, you can look at Oscar winning films for kind of, you know, previously for sort of a hint of what kinds of stories were, were most attractive to those kind of Oscar voters, uh, stories of servitude, stories of suffering, you know, um, top of the Oscar list. <laughs> uh, and there is, I think, a little bit of fascination uh, with, with black trauma um, under the white gaze, where some of our films, I think even now, when there are more Black people along the chain, uh, where you really could maybe take your project somewhere else if you're not happy with the direction. But I think a lot of long timers have been trained almost. So we have to become untrained 
uh, to write it in a way that I think would be most comfortable and healing for the black viewers that are primarily served by a black story and anybody else like Jordan Peele said in Horror Noir, he wanted everyone to love Get Out, but he wrote it for a black audience. And if it didn't work for a black audience, it's a fail. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think even as viewers, some of us have been overtrained to feel like it has to be a super downer to feel important, mm. you know, and, and, it, and in our horror, we have to be careful about that because horror is very violent. So what kinds of violent images are we choosing when we write our stories? Would a, a black an all black Friday the 13th with a white killer be satisfying <laughs> to a black <laughs> audience, you know? <laughs> 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 yeah and, that's a that would be a different story <laughs> yeah, isn't that kind of like um another non-horror movie the four-year-old version where like the main like a, the issue a lot of the issue she's having getting it getting her work produced and out there is she's got these white gatekeepers who are pushing for this everything surrounding black people and black culture and black life has to revolve, has to revolve around some sort of tragedy or poverty or down or and some kind of downtrodden story to feel authentic. And that's the thing that she's struggling with. And I, again, I think, and I'm mentioning this non-horror movie because I think it's kind of like, it permeates throughout any sort of entertainment uh, entity that's trying to like produce um, um, content from other people, so. I think that I think it's this it's it's this it's the same issue and yeah it's to go further yeah there are issues there are issues of race and power dynamics that you do have to explore when you are putting in black black characters in these films and so I honestly I'm not a creative writer so I wouldn't know from here or there or anywhere how to do that properly or the right way or if that even exists so I I guess if I'm, I guess again, because I'm a critic just like Anya, for first and foremost, before any of the, any of the other stuff. So, I guess when I'm watching something and if I see it, I'll kind of know for me personally that, in my opinion, this works and this this works um, successfully as um, a comment, a commentary on race or not on race. And you see just a great character of color kind of interwoven into the story, and it feels. It doesn't feel problematic or damaging or like a stereotype. I'll know it when I see it kind of a thing. For me, that's, I just go with my own gut and, you know, and, and opinion, because this is all, to me, at the end of the day, it's all a, a matter of your opinion. And it, can you kind of extrapolate it and, or maybe even intellectualize it for whatever purposes, or just have a conversation with a friend about it? You know, I think mm -hmm. that's important. Okay. Um, next on, I want to talk about uh, Black women in horror. Um, I have to say, I mean, there's probably more films uh, before this, but when I saw um, Demon Knight and saw Jada Pickett and she, you know, she was this tiny little girl <laughs> and she, you know, she fought a demon and lived at the end, it was shocking. <laughs> it was different. It was like, oh, okay. Um, and then also we had Alien versus Predator, uh, Sine Lathan, like she carried the entire film to the end, even fought a giant alien, which I thought was really cool. Um, also, we have us and, and even 13 ghosts, you know, Rod Digga and, and stuff like this. So um, can Black women carry a film by themselves? Uh, we, we see it with us, but can it continue? Is it good writing, good acting? Good, you know, what, what is the true element to keep that going? I think absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Lupita in, in Us is a great example, and she was robbed twice at the Oscar nominations for that film because that was, movie Us was amazing. Two parts, and yeah. as as Jordan Peele said, you know, at the time he cast her, she had never led a movie, which is ridiculous. So there's just such a pool of talent, and it's not just, of course, Lupita. There's mm -hmm. such a pool of talent, um, you know. Uh, so I think it can continue. And as more marginalized creators are having their stories told, that also means Black women's stories within Black horror. 
are who that have also been marginalized will be told more. I'm really excited with the emergence of Nia DaCosta, you know, uh, directing Candyman, though we're losing her, I think, quickly in horror because she's taken off really quickly. Uh, <laughs> so the Candyman I, shirt. I hope she'll come <laughs> back. I hope she'll come back to horror, you know, yeah. but, but, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think there are a lot more of those stories uh, in the wings. Mm -hmm. Ashley or Anya? Anya's still mute. Anyway, um, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, that's kind of like, uh, that, that's kind of my, uh, that's where my scholarship is right now. I'm honestly, my hyper focus is these Black women directors and creators and the kind of work that they're doing. Um, I still am one of the fiercest advocates for them. I still think that they are, um, incredibly marginalized and I am still kind of fighting as much as I can for these other voices that people are not recognizing, which I'm not happy about. Um, so, and I really want to push for more visibility for them in their work because they are putting Black women front and center in their films. And they, and I love the fact that these films, they have a regional feel to them. They are, folk, they, these are, um, Black women characters that are leading films that are, you know, we're, you're, we're running a gamut of all kinds of horror. We're doing slashers, we're doing psychological, uh, we're doing Southern Gothic. There's all types of um, vampires. There's all types of like really great ideas that are coming from Black women. And I'm still like trying to get them out there so people recognize them and do everything I can to make sure, because this is a really, not only is this kind of an emerging kind of thing to like write about and be excited about as far as like, mm -hmm the academic nerdy stuff that I do, but also just for, for audiences. I was literally just listening to Why Won't You Date Me today, um, the Nicole Byer podcast, and she's talking to another another comic, and they're so just like, they're talking about bad hair, the Justin Simeon movie, and they're just like, is there any black horror? This is like the first black horror movie I've seen, and there's not enough black horror, and I'm just like, it, it was driving me crazy because I'm in the sauce, and I know that there's dozens upon dozens of black mm -hmm. horror films if not hundreds at this point that exist both uh feature films and short films and it's and mm -hmm. that's why this this is this is this is why it makes me so angry because i'm just like no not enough people know that so much work exists that they could just go on youtube or go on vimeo and then mm -hmm. see it and then even just support these people or promote their work or there's so much more out there and Oh, it's it's a it's a labor that I love, but it's also it gets really frustrating when I hear stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just like Ashley said, it's it's, it's um, there's there's an issue of visibility. Uh, there are the stories are there; they are being told. They're they're there, um, especially within the short films. You have you have Suicide by Sunlight. You have Hair Hair Wolf. You have all of these these short films that are that have been made that feature black women as at front and center and they're living until the end and, and all of these things, but um, they're just, it's hard to access them. Uh, there, there was a point where I had written an article for Fangoria at one point that was highlighting short films that, that these, these, it was kind of a who to watch kind of piece. Mm -hmm. And there were a ton of, of directors and writers of color within there, but it, it ultimately, ultimately had to be cut because you just can't find their short films. The average reader can't find them. They can't access them. They might be on a, there might be clips of them on a director's reel that you can find somewhere, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think one of the keys is to get those films, those short films, especially out there, not only in the eyes of the audiences, but in the eyes of the green lighters, the movers and shakers who can actually give them these, these larger projects, give them budgets and let them tell the stories that they wanna tell okay. and that we need to see. <laughs> Um, this is a question for Du, actually. It says, Professor Du, briefly describe Black horror as an offshoot of Afrofuturism early in horror noir. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. Let's talk about the term Afrofuturism. It was coined in the, the mid-1990s. And although at UCLA, I have been teaching it as sort of the Black speculative arts, really across the diaspora. Um, more recently, I've been looking at it as African-American because that was what the term meant when it was coined. And Nigerian-American author Nnedi Okorafor has coined the term African futurism and African juju, which is slightly different. But basically, it, the Black speculative arts, meaning science fiction, fantasy, and yes, horror, 
and and it can include comics it can include books films music even janelle monet sun ra um so you're sort of genre bending you're fusing musical styles you're um it's not just necessarily about the future despite the word futurism in the term <laughs> it's, it's speculative the what if you know the the the, the lost world wakanda is afrofuturism get out is afrofuturism um so horror is a part of that black horror specifically is a part of that afrofuturism subset and i saw a question someone's was asking about, you know, Latinx stories and whether that's a part of Afrofuturism. I mean, there are obviously Afro-Latinos, so yes. But also I have a feeling that in years to come, we're going to see a very specific kind of horror that's coming out of those communities and those countries, you know, um, and they're very, they're varied countries, obviously. So what Mexican horror is already a, a big thing. Uh, so what other kinds of Spanish language horror will we be seeing? Hmm. Okay. Um, we have another question here uh, from Phil. It's a long one. <laughs> this is one of the most compelling episodes of Lovecraft Country. Was <laughs> It's full pivotal of, to sci-fi in the episode, I Am. Do you think it's possible that Afrofuturism could or will command the same kind of cultural spotlight that Black horror has been enjoying in the past couple of years? Oh, I think it does and has. I mean, and they're also very related. So it's not surprising at all that science fiction leaps out in, <laughs> in Lovecraft Country. It also, you know, Get Out was science fiction when you think about it. So, so they're really already joined and Afrofuturism as a movement kind of has a head start, I think, in terms of its recognition internationally, as opposed to Black horror. I mean, there are symposia I mean, uh, you know, around the world on Afrofuturism. So um, yeah, to answer the question, I think Afrofuturism is and has been uh, very much a, much a part of the cultural conversation, uh, just like Black horror. Okay. Uh I, there's a question here that I thought was pretty interesting um, from Ariel. It says, why do you feel that a genre that itself is about traumatic content can be so healing when it's done well? And I, I've experienced horror films where I, I would watch and, and I would just feel uplifted. It's, it's weird. <laughs> it's a weird feeling. Um, or I would cry or feel, feel like I understood them better. Or I was able to get out of a situation that I was in by watching it. Um, I, I can't explain it. It's just something that comes over me because I get so engulfed with the characters. Um, have you guys experienced that and your thoughts on that? Absolutely. <laughs> Go ahead. No, no, you, you go first. <laughs> okay, well, I to, I, yes, I have felt that um, in many aspects of horror. There's, there's, um, there's the representational aspect of it. Uh, like, like the craft for me was that one um, because I'm biracial and I have a black mom. I have a white dad, and I had seen, you know, white women are plenty represented in horror, but <laughs> with uh, Rachel True's role as Rochelle. Um, along with the, the three white women of the craft, I saw that, that I was reflected somewhere within those four, somewhere in there, I'm an amalgamation of those four women. And um, in that film, they wield a sexual power um, that, that comes through in puberty and then comes through in their teen years. As they come into themselves, they come into a sexual power. And that kind of representation and that kind of seeing that on screen was something wild to see as someone who had been catcalled at a very young age, you know, and that's something that a lot of women, a lot of black women and a lot of women had experienced, but um, we had all been made to feel some kind of shame for that. And this movie said, no, 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 that, that, that same body has a power and it frightens those same men who will, who will cat call you, who will do those things, who will, who will treat your body as if it's something to be ashamed of and objectified. And so that on that level, these, these movies can be uh, uh, satisfying, but on another level, there's a catharsis that comes with the justice and retribution that comes to these people um, who, who hurt people 
uh, like in the craft, the, the, the white girl, the mean white girl, she gets her comeuppance. And in the real world, in my experience, that kind of thing doesn't generally happen. Uh, so uh, th that also happens with rape revenge movies. You get a catharsis um, by castrating some guy in a bathtub um, because he's not going to get that. He's going to get a slap on the wrist if he goes to court, if you take him to court, if you even get that far. Um, and, and so there's a violence in those films that's cathartic because, uh, and I believe it, it wasn't me that thought of this. It was um, in Men, Women, and Chainsaws. Uh, the, the scholar who wrote it said that uh, castrating someone in a bathtub will give you a catharsis that a bullet can't. And that kind of catharsis, that kind of release that you get is extremely satisfying and, and horror is perfect for that. And there's not many other genres that can do that for you and give you that kind of set. And it might be petty and I don't, I don't care. I don't care. It is petty. <laughs> I like it. I like the feeling that you get like, yes, someone finally got theirs. And, mm. and, and this, this woman feels good and, and good for her. Okay. okay. All right. There's a catharsis to that, and then there's a catharsis that that comes with <laughs> people who have had these these uh, uh, racial experiences and and racial traumas that they they cannot get justice for in the real world, and to see that reflected on the screen, and to see that 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 fantasy played out, there's there's something mentally satisfying to that. There's something that it's almost self care in a way to to watch that and to view it. Okay. And something rebellious about viewing it too. Okay, so this is will go to all of you. Um, do you think Jordan Peele gave us a new formula of horror? Did he change it to the way that it um, is satisfying yet fearful? Um, the truth. I mean, he showed us so many different ways with his, you know, two films, Us and Get Out, but. What 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 knew that he brought us to the black horror? Authenticity. Um, I'm speaking to, you know, you, you have white directors who try their best, uh, like like Wes Craven. You know, he did Vampire in Brooklyn. He did The People Under the Stairs. You know, he he did these things that that talked about fear of white spaces. That talked about white science versus black magic. All of these these movies that that talked about these things, but th there are still elements that. Um, that are rightfully called out because he doesn't have that experience. He doesn't have that black experience and Peel does and did. He knows that he can write that. And, and so it, it strikes a, a chord with, with people who have been through that. And there's a lot of people who have been through it as much as you love the people under the stairs, as much as you love vampire in Brooklyn or, or might not love vampire in Brooklyn, but, but, you know, these, these films can, can speak to something um, that, that a white director, as much as they try and as many books as they read and movies as they watch, just can't speak to. Um, and I think that it's, it's mostly authenticity and opportunity that he provided. You know, there, there's the monkey paw productions, you know, and hiring these black creatives um, to give them the reins and not just be in front of the camera, but behind the camera and, and telling these stories from the top down and from the bottom up. Yeah, I think Lean. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, no. Actually. Oh, okay. no. <laughs> it's probably been, I, I think, uh, really leaning into uh, courage and authenticity. Well, having to be in a position, first of all, that Jordan Peele was in, even though it was not an easy battle for him to get this movie made. At the same time, it was easier for him than it would be for any of us here because he had the cultural capital he had built up. After all the years, he was a beloved, you know, performer for, for, the country so so he had an opportunity there to really be courageous and write his truth and actually learn his truth because in early drafts or when he first started outlining he didn't even know it was about race right so think about that he he, mm. he was able to sort of explore the concept and then come to oh i'm talking about this and I think that is the lesson, I wouldn't call it a formula, but that is the lesson that I think all horror creators need to lean on is to move away from sort of what we've seen over and over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And whether it's related to trauma, like my mother, my late mother, who was a civil rights activist, loved horror. 
I think because of the trauma she had suffered under state violence as a protester in the 1960s. She was tear gassed. She wore dark glasses her whole adult life after being tear gassed when she was 20 years old. So what do you do with that anger uh, to speak to Anya's point? Or what do you even just do with that fear? And I think that's one of the reasons our mothers and our grandmothers love horror for a lot of us who are black. We learn it from our dang grandmothers mm -hmm. because they were living under fearful, fearful circumstances. And there's something about a horror movie, even if black people aren't in it, that makes you feel seen when you've been afraid. And also helps you figure out some survival tactics. One of the things I love about us is how the characters are like, pick up a bat, you know, use your feet and run, <laughs> fight back, hide. Uh, there's no tripping and falling in us. Mm -hmm. Ashley? No, I don't have much to add to that. That's pretty much everything yeah. I was gonna say. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I guess, for me and for a lot of other people, again, you're watching regardless of who's on screen. It definitely does kind of like, um, it, it does, you know, make you jump out of your seat a little when you see some a character that you that you can identify with even through even with skin tone. But uh, yeah, I think for me, it just I'm seeing people go through experiences, and I don't and I feel less alone when I'm kind of watching these films. And so I think that's what it is for me. And, and that and I co-sign everything Tanana or even Anya has said about that. Okay. Um, so let's move on to the elephant in the room that you guys, I mean, it was announced <laughs> on AMC Shutter. It was like the untitled Black Horror Anthology. Uh, I know you guys can't really say much about it. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like, took all. They like <laughs> all scaredy cats. That's why we like horror. That's the real <laughs> We are just scared. I was cats. about to tear this whole thing out. <laughs> um, but when that was announced, it was like, oh my goodness, that's so awesome. So, um, what can I? What can you say? What What are we hope to see different? Maybe, maybe bring to the table that's different. Maybe could say I'm leaning in to hear Ashley answer this one. Uh, uh -uh, you know more than me. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I will what, say. Will we see any tropes in it? <laughs> um, listen, it's in the very early stages, I'll say that. And there's okay. not really much I'm even allowed to say of what little I do know. Okay. But I think I'm allowed to say this uh, because it was announced that I'm working on uh, one of the scripts with my husband, Stephen Barnes, and it's an adaptation, okay? And I think that this is important because at the Horror Noir premiere, one of the things I said as the hostess was that the biggest gap in Black horror was an adaptation. Uh, there are a lot of great screenwriters out there, original screenwriters out there. But, you know, before that and, and during that, there have been a lot of short story writers and novelists who have even the late great Octavia Butler, who did write a vampire novel, Fledgling, has not even yet been adapted to screen. It is criminal, right? So one of the things I am most excited about with the new Black anthology series that, that AMC slash Shudder announced is that there will be opportunities to see adaptations. And I'm very excited about that. It sounds exciting. <laughs> very exciting. So, but um, yeah, we can't wait. I, I believe it was announced probably you know, coming out at the end of this year. So um, I, I'm, I'm just, I just can't wait. I think a lot of people can't wait. We've, we wanted to see something different and I think we're gonna get a chance to see it. And thank you ladies for that. <laughs> so, but thank you everyone for this amazing conversation, um, Anya, Tana Nareev, <laughs> Ashley. Thank you this evening for joining um, Convoy X Fango um, that hosted by Fangoria. Thank you so much. Um, those who are watching, please follow these ladies um, on Twitter, Instagram. Ashley has her Twitter. Ashley takes notes, which I, I think is pretty cool. Um, she also has her Graveyard Shift Sisters. Uh, check out that website. Um, she has some really good um, interviews on there that she showcased a lot of uh, Black creators, uh, Black women creators, of course. Um, Anya, check out her, her site, uh, anyawrites.com. Um, she has video oh, yeah, nasties. Oh. 
I haven't updated that in ages. <laughs> okay, well, then don't go. <laughs> but I did read some of your stuff, oh and it was actually um, pretty cool. I, I was laughing. Your, I use your stuff in my class. I'll yeah, class. <laughs> it's still being used. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> and Tana, Tana do. Um, she actually, her and her husband, I, they on her website, they have a course together, Stephen Barnes, The Sunken Place. Um, I was thinking about getting that course because it sounds pretty interesting. www.sunkenplaceclass.com. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and she also talks about Afrofuturism too. Nice. So I was like, hmm, I'm going to have to check that out. Um, but yeah, th thank you guys so much uh, for joining. And um, I don't know. What other insights should you guys say or anything for people watching about Black Horror? Support it. Keep, support it, yeah. Keep watching. Support Black Horror. <laughs> if you like it, support it. And if you're in a position to green light, green light these projects with these Black creators and storytellers. Hire the Black DP. Hire the Black screenwriter. Do that. Yes. Simple as. <laughs> So thank you attendees, um, panelists, Fangoria, for, um, everything, it was just awesome. Those who are watching um, on Facebook and Zoom. Also, this would be on uh, Fangoria's YouTube and Facebook, uh, Facebook page shortly. And um, also go to their website so you can find out more information about these wonderful uh, Convoy uh, Fango um, live panels as well, so. Thank you guys for joining. <laughs>